meeting to order. I'll start with the attendance. So we do have all three board, uh, all three community board members here. The borough president's office is uh, represented. Uh, we have Loren from Council Member Matteo's office, and we're just waiting on Council Member Borelli and Council Member Rose's office. So uh, we're going to start now. So Victoria, you're up uh, from the Alice Austin House. Take it away. Thank you, everyone, and it's nice to see you all here this morning. Um, a few faces I haven't seen for a while, unfortunately. Um, so this year, the, obviously, the Alice Austin House is grateful to the Borough President and Staten Island City Council members for supporting the meaningful history, photography, and education programming offered to Staten Islanders of all ages to experience and learn about the famous historical Staten Islander and early photographer Alice Austin. 2020 was a very difficult year for many nonprofits and saw us forced to close our doors to the public for six months. We took this time to convert our project programs to virtual offerings, including our education programs, which are in full swing with our Department of Teaching Artists delivering all programs via Zoom. AAH launched a new website and bought our exhibitions and collections online. And we were invited to hold our annual Vintage Camera Day online also. I'm thrilled to report that these activities have allowed the retention of all of our staff members. I'm also pleased to report that in 2020, we installed a landmark exhibition titled Powerful and Dangerous, The Words and Images of Audrey Lord. AAA held a series of free public programs to accompany the exhibition, including two outdoor film screenings and a partnership with New York, Brooklyn and Queens Public Libraries to present a panel of six Lord's, Lord's colleagues to a virtual audience of over 400 and subsequent screenings which have seen viewership of over 1,000 New Yorkers. The museum is proud to continue to provide education and creative arts programming through the City Council's special cultural immigrant, cultural after-school adventures, and the Coalition of Theatre of Colour initiatives. And this is secured by council members Debbie Rose and Stephen Matteo. And we work with South Shore students um, and also look forward to doing that again in 2022 with the support of council member Joseph Borelli. With Borough President funding, we will program an outdoor stage, which I heard Janice before speaking about working with LPC. Uh, we have all of our permissions in place. Um, it will be installed on the grounds for a period of six weeks, May 12th to June 30th, with three distinct performance weekend events offered free of charge to the public and in accordance with social distancing guidelines. Performance dates are as followed. May 15th, 1 to 4 p.m. That will be with, uh, in partnership with Mega Park Radio. We will have uh, June 19th, which is June 10th, and that is in coordination with the Plywood Project. And June 20th, we will present a family day for the Lunicorns, which is Staten Island's um, Trans Latinx uh, performance. Our request to City Council members for FY19 is to provide women's history programming and LGBTQ programming for Staten Island public school students in each district. The museum's board and staff are proud to serve the community in ensuring that the legacy of Alice Austin is known to Staten Islanders and to preserve this landmark treasure in partnership with New York City Parks Department. I extend a warm welcome to all to the museum for time to book to tours. You just use our website for that or you can call. And to enjoy our spring and summer public programming, which includes a new exhibition titled Radical Tenderness, Trans for Trans Portrait Photography. And that's time to coincide with National Trans Visibility Day on March 31st. I thank you for your support and consideration. It was uh, great that you were able to retain staff. It was a very good thing. Are you uh, working with uh, that project, that sculpture there on your grounds? I'm sorry, Joseph. What was that about the sculpture? Are you working with uh, 
the folks who are putting the sculpture there? The, um, the sculpture on the ground, so it's, uh, it's a sculpture that's also a stage and it's uh, in collaboration with the Plywood Project. It was also um, due to be installed on after it um, being our site on the promenade um, well, on Richmond that's, Terrace. That's, that's, that's been cancelled. It's going to stay. Yes, I know. Yeah. So, so it's, just, it's just going to be with us for six weeks. Yeah, okay. And those, so those are your requests for FY22, right? What you just seriated? That's right. Thank Great, thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Victoria? No. Thank, thank you, you, Victoria. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you coming. Uh, I just want to acknowledge now that we do have Brianna from Council Member Corelli's office on the line, and we have Issa from Council Member Rose's office. So. We do have a full board attendance. Here. Also, uh, Christian is here from uh, Councilman Rose's office as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, moving right along, uh, we have uh, Michelle Sabatino from the Staten Island Center for Independent Living. So, Michelle, take it away once again. If everybody could just mute their mics because we're getting some feedback. Okay. Go ahead, Michelle. Good morning. My name is Michelle Sabatino. Uh, I am the director of Sentinel Center for the agency, as she just said. Um, I've been at the agency for eight years, and I've been the executive director the past two years. Uh, our mission statement is to keep people living in the community independently who have disabilities. So we work with people with disabilities of all types and all kinds. Um, we're very unique, whereas other agencies are very specific of what disability they work with. We're fortunate enough that we can work with all disabilities. Uh, we advocate with legislators as well, too, uh, for removing barriers for people with disabilities. Uh, we support the community by providing benefits counseling. Um, we have uh, peer support groups. We have a health and wellness workshop. We have a women's group, a men's group. Um, we work with Hungerford, uh, but unfortunately with the pandemic, they haven't been here. And uh, since they haven't come, I had to lay off that person uh, who worked with them to cook with them because we teach them uh, ADL, so we teach them cooking skills and computer skills. Um, we pretty much do a little bit of everything, and we're not for profit, so there's no charge. We're a very small office. We've never closed down since the pandemic began. We went fully remote, but with the 20% cut, it's just very difficult to maintain um, a full staff. Uh, I had to lay off one person, like I said, and not all the grants are coming in. Uh, that the fiscal year started as of July 1st, so that's frustrating. Um, yeah, the borough president has helped us with the maintenance of the building because we had a leak, so we had to redo that because we do own our building. We've been on Castleton Avenue across street from near Rumsey. But we've been working remotely, we've been holding groups on uh, Zoom or phone calls because a lot of them are seniors and do not know how to use a computer. But we have not stopped since the pandemic began. And um, I'm hoping we can continue doing this great work for nothing to keep the people in the community who are disabled, independent, and not go back to institutions. We also uh, uh, help people get out of the nursing home and back into the community as well. We do a little bit of everything. Hey, does anybody have any questions for Michelle from the board members? So, so you're looking for just general funding or not, not for vans or anything like that, for program funding? Program funding uh, for transportation from the agency. We have a driver who's a retired uh, board of ed driver. 
and he picks up our uh, constituents in the community, brings them to the agency for peer support groups, and then takes them home because a lot of them are at or below poverty level, and they can't even afford the assessor ride or a bus, you know, public transportation. So the funding is to continue the peer support groups uh, for people with disabilities and to provide transportation to and from the agency for them. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, uh, moving right along. Oh, does anybody else have any questions for Michelle? I'm sorry. No, thank you. Okay, moving right along, uh, we have Janice Manga, who is going to be making a presentation. She is from the Staten Island Museum. For those of you who may not know her, half of all of Staten Island Cultural. Yeah, Janet, take it away. Hi, everyone. Yeah, bear with me. Sorry, Janice. <laughs> you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so bear with me, my testimony is a little longer because I'm representing multiple institutions. Uh, so good morning, Borough President Otto and office, members of the Staten Island Borough Board and community leaders. I'm Janice Monger, President and CEO of the Staten Island Museum. Today, I'm representing five of Staten Island's leading cultural organizations that are members of the New York City's Cultural Institutions Group. On behalf of Stug Harbor Cultural Center and Botanical Garden, the Staten Island Museum, the Staten Island Children's Museum, Historic Richmond Town, and the Staten Island Zoo, we appreciate this opportunity to address the Borough Board. We are proud to be long-standing cultural assets to the Staten Island community, and your support is essential to our resiliency and sustainability. Throughout this past year, with the most difficult of circumstances brought on by the pandemic, Cultural institutions collaborated and shared resources citywide, and we adapted quickly to make sure we could continue to serve our community even with new conditions. The public has depended on our outdoor spaces for respite, has attended virtual programs in our buildings for continued learning, and Snug Harbor even served as a COVID-19 testing site. Our cultural organizations have fought to ensure that we remain vital community resources for mental well being and connection during this stressful time to support public life, public health, and public benefit. As we are still facing a protracted crisis, we need your support to continue providing cultural programming for the community and to keep Staten Islanders employed. Additionally, we request your assistance with ensuring that our organizations are supported with capital resources that address both critical infrastructure needs and key amenities to support long-term goals for providing the community with updated facilities that Staten Islanders deserve. The Harbor Cultural Center and Botanic Garden is where the arts, history, and nature converge. Founded in 1801 as a charitable rest home for, quote, aged, decrepit, and worn out sailors, end quote. Today, Snug Harbor is a vibrant regional cultural center with dynamic programming in the arts, horticulture, and urban agriculture. It serves people of diverse backgrounds and all ages on an 83-acre campus that is an unexpected oasis for Staten Islanders and other visitors. Snug Harbor envisions being a locally impactful, nationally renowned destination, true to its values of artistic vibrancy and community inclusion and discovery, stewardship and conservation. Snug Harbor's grounds have remained open throughout the pandemic, providing community with safe space for exploration and discovery and supporting local businesses with artists and artists with opportunities to engage audiences safely and within pandemic guidelines. It is a proud Smithsonian affiliate the only one on Staten Island with unique ability to activate partnerships for community benefit. For example, Snug Harbor Youth Volunteers Initiative is a mentoring program for local youth offered in conjunction with CUNY's School of Civic Leadership. Recent highlights at Snug Harbor include its weekly farmer's market, which donated more than 5,000 pounds of fresh produce to local food pantries, the first annual Pig Island Festival, which drew hundreds of participants for a day of safe outdoor fun, and groundbreaking on the new music hall annex. The Staten Island Museum, founded in 1881 and devoted to natural science, art, and history, is open to visitors on weekends, and we have been since September, with all the safety protocols and proper air filtration in its modernized facility that this board helped fund. 
and we have a full roster of virtual programs. This past year, the exhibition Women of the Nation Arise highlighted Staten Islanders who contributed to the national movement for women's right to vote in honor of the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Staten Island Museum converted the exhibition to an online and outdoor presentation during COVID. Programs became virtual, including our annual Earth Day How-To Festival that has to date received more than 5,500 views. The Staten Island Museum will open a new exhibition by artist Jennifer Angus in July that explores biodiversity inspired by the museum's world-renowned cicada collection. And SIM will continue to offer annual events such as Moth Night to explore night science and the Fence Show to showcase local artists and artisans. Staten Island Museum is in de design phases toward opening the Steam Education Center. Staten Island Children's Museum is fortunate to have steadfast support from its community during these unprecedented times. The support has allowed the Children's Museum to continue programming during the pandemic. While the building has been closed since mid-March 2020, the Children's Museum has used this time to harken back to its roots and once again become a museum without walls. Programming has adapted and now 1,000 children per month are offered outdoor school enrichment online materials for parents and teachers resources to help children learn remotely and outdoors have been produced and the distribution of monthly STEM kits to families and art kits to pre-K children has um, taken place. An additional 900 elementary school students are receiving weekly enrichment programs via Google Classroom. The art they create is on display at shop rights throughout the island. For which includes renovating restrooms, adding a family gender neutral bathroom, replacing water fountains with water bottle fillers, and an addition of five new hands-on interactive exhibits that will attract audiences to safely return to indoor play later this spring, along with COVID HVAC updates to clean and purify circulated indoor air. Historic Richmond Town has been preserving and sharing Staten Island history for 165 years. This Staten Island community cultural staple is nestled on amongst 111 acres over four unique sites with a total of 45 historic structures. During the onset of the, pa historic, the pandemic, Historic Richmond Town produced virtual offerings from behind the scenes tours, library, staff library viewings, and historical interpretation videos. These reached over 40,000 people across the country. Historic Richmond Town reopened the fundraising Tavern Terrace Beer Garden and its pumpkin picking at Decker Farm, which were met with sold out tickets and appreciation for all the extra COVID safety features in place to allow guests to experience community and culture during the stress and hardship brought on by the pandemic. Historic Richmond Town eagerly sets the 2021 events calendar for a return of classic programming like the Richmond County Fair. And lastly, but not leastly, the Staten Island Zoo is the first of America's zoos to be founded more than 80 years ago with an educational mission and the legacy it continues. The Staten Island Zoo remains at the forefront of the effective education programs and its cultural role as a place of adventure, discovery, and fun for all ages. Having opened its exciting new aquarium, the zoo now directs its attention and the attention of the borough board as well to the development of the flow entrance discovery zone, which will dramatically alter the flow of visitors to the facility. The traditional entrance to the zoo from its Broadway address has long been replaced by the Clove Road entry, where more than 70% of the visitors access the facility. And presently, it's a remarkable opportunity to create a discovery zone of nature sites and sounds to welcome audiences. A total of $11 million has been allocated to this project through Borough President Otto, Council Members Matteo, Rose, and Borelli, and the Department of Cultural Affairs. This project is expected to enter design phase in May 2021. The zoo is open every day with normal operating hours. Protocols have been implemented to provide for the safety of visitors and staff. The zoo is providing virtual tours and educational programming as well. Even though each of our Staten Island cultural institutions has a unique vision and mission, we are here today united with our message about the numerous positive impacts that we have on the economy of the borough and the quality of life on Staten Island, which we believe we enrich. Together, we employ more than 200 people and reach over 1 million 
speakers virtually and in person. We support countless local small businesses and have daily impact in the lives of Staten Island residents. Staten Island CIGs are vital resources that provide essential services to the island families, tourists, and visitors every day. We know we can't do this alone, and we hope that you help us carry forward our missions that all Staten Islanders deserve access to culture, nature, education, and history. Our cultural organizations play an important role in the recovery of Staten Island and the greater city of New York. We look forward to fully resuming in-person programming, especially school groups, and full capacity visitation in the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Welcome. Janice, uh, let me ask, uh, once the water, warmer weather comes, like in the summer, do the culturals anticipate doing some more outdoor programming? Try yes, and ab absolutely. So, um, especially Snug Harbor, you know, with the very broad grounds, as well as the zoo, um, Snow Harbor has a lot of partnerships um, coming up as well as presenting their own outdoor programming. There's going to be a series of markets. There will be, you know, the return of outdoor events um, for and historic Richmond Town. You know, they they actually did um, the Tavern Terrace beer gardens even last season. So they'll be bringing that back. And it sounds like they're, you know, looking toward doing Richmond County Fair as, as well come September. Um, and we are looking at the Staten Island Museum, looking at you know utilizing the grounds um, as we resume some outdoor programming for, we have summer nights events that are like hands-on craft workshops. Um, so yes, definitely the outdoor spaces will be utilized. And you know we have all been tracking very carefully um, the the protocols and the kind of you know, they're start the the restrictions are starting to to loosen some, but obviously we take very seriously, um, you know, the COVID protocols that we need to keep in place. And in fact, museums there were about twenty five museums citywide, art museums mostly that came together to do collective protocols. So I was part of that process. So you know, we we are very adherent to that, but we all know that outdoor space, you know, is is safer though you still have to keep you know be careful but um so yes we will definitely utilize grounds of snug harbor richmond town um and the children's museum has been doing you know outdoor um sort of camp style sessions for children too so yes right. does anybody else have a question for janice yeah yes. just yes. quickly janice the idea Sorry. when you will are... Um, so that is a very active conversation right now, performing arts group in terms of um, the protocols that need to be in place to reopen. So um, New York City has an open culture initiative you may have heard of. So they're really right now kind of focusing on outdoor while they're figuring out indoor. Um, you know, it's really partially from the governor's office. They've started though, you may have seen, you know, to resume some of the outdoor stadium, you know, they're, they're, they're testing out, I think, different scenarios for how to have, you know, um, cr more large crowd audiences. So it's hard to say exactly when that's going to resume. So, but we just saw that gathering limits have been broadened in terms of weddings and ceremonies and such. So I think there's a trajectory of that. Um, but it's it's not clear an exact date where that can occur. Um, but for instance, Staten Island Museum, we are doing partnering with the DOE to offer a spring break um, family session that it is indoors. And it's just sort of centered on your pods. You know, you kind of meet with your group and then you're spaced out from others. So Definitely, there's a lot of um, focus on, you know, how can we bring back in-person activity, um, but we have to work with, um, you know, the, the overseeing bodies on that too, obviously. So, um, but hopefully we're on that path, especially as vaccines become more and more available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Janice, let me, may I just quickly ask you, have there been any conversations uh, with the CIGs regarding baseline budgeting? Um, for FY22, you mean? Yep. Or, or just in general? Um, 
I mean, I think that, I mean, we, we definitely collectively speak to, to the city across, there's now 34 CIGs. Um, I mean, we, we, I don't know that we're trying to focus on that right this minute, given the COVID crisis and what the city is facing. But I think going forward, that is something that we can advocate for more heavily. Does that make sense? Yes, that, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, anybody else have a question for Janice? Okay, thank you, Janice. Okay, you uh, moving right along, we have Anita Bruckmeyer here from the JCC. It's good to see you, Anita. Take it away. Wonderful, <laughs> Wonderful seeing you. Good morning, as Marie has said, my name is Anita Bruckmeyer. I am the Chief Development Officer at the JCC of Staten Island. Um, since I'm only representing the JCC, I'm working hard to keep my presentation to three minutes, but I did provide a full presentation. So what you're going to hear is an abridged version of what I submitted. I'd like to start by thanking all of our local officials for their continuous support. Um, we would not be where we are right now without you nor would we have been able to do what we've done over the past year without your support. The Jewish Community Center of Staten Island is recognized as a central hub of service for the Staten Island community in normative times and periods of crisis. The JCC's actions and decisions are guided by identifying unmet needs within our community and working collectively with the city, state, local partners to provide support to all of our residents. Annually, we serve over 40,000 individuals throughout the borough, and that includes frail senior adults, those who are homebound, individuals with cognitive impairments, Holocaust survivors, homeless, unemployed, those facing economic crisis, immigrant populations, at-risk youth and children with cancer, and individuals with disabilities. COVID-19 has shattered the lives of New Yorkers leaving thousands susceptible to both physical and psychological effects of the pandemic. At the onset, the JCC mobilized staff to ensure that immediate critical support was available to the most vulnerable. Within days, the JCC developed and implemented the COVID-19 Connect to Recovery program, dedicated to providing a continuum of social services. Through private and city funding, the JCC has provided over 25,000 grab and go and home delivered meals. Our food pantry services have quadrupled, feeding over 18,000 individuals most at risk. Health insurance navigators have assisted over 900 individuals enrolled for medical insurance. The JCC was chosen to be part of the city's resource navigator program to help those who have tested positive for COVID-19 through vital resources and referrals. And we've reached over 4,000 individuals to date. The JCC was also chosen to be one of the city's learning lab providers to support full-time childcare and blended learning, and we are working with 400 children. One of the greatest unmet needs that we continue to identify is the lack of supportive programs, especially for those facing economic hardships. Assisting individuals to obtain critical support is one of the greatest needs within communities experiencing disproportionate impacts of COVID-19. The devastating effects of this deadly virus has impacted the most vulnerable. Public health restrictions can also lead to social and depression in a time of uncertainty. As a result, the JCC is requesting discretionary funding to providing a continuum of concrete services to the most vulnerable populations in Staten Island. And that includes senior adults, immigrant populations, individuals with disabilities, children with cancer, youth and families, Holocaust survivors, and those facing poverty. Many facing poverty are facing this for the first time in their lives. The requested discretionary dollars will assist to stabilize those in crisis. Our promise to our fellow New Yorkers is that we will continue to utilize all of our resources to assist in the recovery process and rebuild our community. Together with discretionary support, we can make sure that the most vulnerable have access to opportunities and support to maintain sustainability. The JCC is also requesting capital funds to support repairing the existing roof at the Bernicau building. 
Restoring the damage to the roof will also enable us to continue full operations of the facility, which has been um, had staff working since day one of the crisis. Um, so repairing the roof will help us to continue that and allow us to provide critical community resources and services. Unfortunately, without the repairs, the roof will continue to deteriorate and damage other parts of the building and eventually present unsafe conditions. So it's very important we take care of that. Again, thank you to um, all the help we've received in the past, and we look forward to partnering with our local officials again this year. Thank you, Anita. Does anybody have any questions for Anita? Yeah, just a quick one. You, you have connections in many North Shore communities, and you do great work. Yes. With with regard to the outreach you're now doing, are you going to be including um, sort of a pitch to make sure people get vaccinated? Because we, we have vaccine sites where, you know, I hate to say it, but like not a lot of people come to them. So uh, we, need, we need some kind of outreach that's more effective in getting people to the vaccine sites. Well, while we can't transport right no, I now. I understand um, that, but yeah. get well, we are educating and. I'm sorry, um, there was, and this wasn't offered by the J, but we did have it at the Carter Center. There was a pop up there and we're continuing to look for opportunities so that, um, but you know what we're finding is people need to be educated because when we were the pop out site um, at the Carter Center and we contacted the senior adults that we work with um, in the Stapleton Senior Adult Program, as well as the NYCHA residents, so many people did not want to take the vaccine. So a large thing that we're seeing, a large need is educating um, individuals. And that, that, that's, that's what I'm asking yeah. you. Are you willing to do that? Because that seems to be the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. That would be very helpful. Anybody else have a question for Anita? Okay, thank you, Anita. You okay, are. moving right along. Uh, we have Carol from the Pride Center of Staten Island. Um, Carol, I did get Lisa's email and I will get you that updated paperwork. Uh, and uh, go and uh, take it away, please. All right, thank you so much. And I will apologize in advance. My puppy thinks that bird is a squeaky toy. So if you hear some barking, I apologize. So. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Bullock. I'm the executive director of the Pride Center. Thank you for your time this morning, and thank you for your support last year. It was so helpful. Uh, we're requesting funding to be awarded this, this year, as it will be even more important for us. The Pride Center of Staten Island's LGBTQ Community Center is the cornerstone for Staten Island's LGBTQ individuals, families, and allies. There are nearly 500,000 people living on Staten Island, and the Pride Center is the island's only LGBT program and service provider. The Pride Center offers supportive counseling services for individuals, couples, and families, programming for youth and seniors, an HIV prevention program, which includes free and confidential HIV testing, multi-generational social events and activities, and the Staten Island Pride Fest celebrations. The Pride Center requests support for this year's Pride, event, Pride Fest events, as well as support for ongoing programs and services. When COVID-19 emerged as a threat in New York City in March of 2020, the Pride Center of Staten Island closed its physical office to the public to protect seniors, people with chronic conditions, and people with compromised immune systems. One key component of the Pride Center's mission is providing social support to the LGBTQ and ally community. LGBTQ people experience social isolation at higher rates than non-LGBTQ people during non-emergent social conditions. So, uh, social isolation is especially prevalent among LGBTQ older adults and young people. According to Movement Advancement Project, Sage and Diverse Elders Coalition, LGBT older adults are twice as likely to live alone as non-LGBT adults and often face social isolation and vulnerability 
Americans are also frequent also frequently experience social isolation, especially if their families or the people they live with do not accept their sexual orientation or gender identity. During this current period of social distancing, the Pride Center expects social isol the Pride Center expects social isolation for LGBTQ people to increase. In the face of the challenges presented by COVID-19, the Pride Center of Staten Island remains dedicated to the values of community, inclusion, allyship, and brave space. In that spirit, the Pride Center of Staten Island has moved many programs and services as possible to digital platforms where they continue to operate. During COVID-19, the Pride Center of Staten Island has made more referrals to food pantries and other food access services than ever before. Additionally, demand for supportive counseling services has increased dramatically. Between June 1st and August 31st of 2019, the Pride Center provided 204 counseling sessions for individuals, couples, and families. Between June 1st and August 31st, of 2020, the Pride Center provided 426 counseling sessions to individuals, couples, and families. This represents a 108% uh, increase in the provision of counseling services. And to add to that, we also brought on four uh, full-time interns who are all at capacity at this point. In an effort to safely resume some in-person services, such as supportive counseling services, the Pride Center of Staten Island, and I'm very happy to announce this, is relocating its offices to 66 Willow Avenue, Suite 200, just south of Bay Street. The layout of the new space will allow for socially distant, distanced counseling sessions and support groups for LGBTQ plus family, uh, people and families to take place in person. While the Pride Center offers dynamic programs and services throughout the year, May and June are special months for the LGBTQ and allied community. New York City celebrates Pride during this time uh, to commemorate the Stonewall Riots, which sparked the contemporary LGBTQ rights movement. Staten Island Pride Fest has always drawn visitors from other boroughs and New Jersey to our shores. But when Pride Fest went virtual in 2020, Pride Fest, Pride Fest events drew an audience from across the United States and beyond. The Pride Center of Staten Island will build on this international audience interest for Pride Fest 2021, which launches the New York City Pride season. Investment from the borough and the city is crucial in that it signals that Staten Island is an LGBTQ inclusive and welcoming borough. Staten Island has a rich LGBTQ history. Photographer Alice Austin lived, lived here with her partner Gertrude Tate, a history that is illuminated by the Alice Austin House. Audre Lorde, a black lesbian feminist poet and activist, raised her family here and wrote some of her most important work during that time. In partnership with the Wagner College Holocaust Center, the Pride Center commemorated Lord's life and work with a street named in her honor in June of 2019. Continued support of the Pride Center activities signals to the Staten Island community that LGBTQ people are valued here. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so Carol, you're completely leaving um, your current space and going to Willow? We are. Uh, we okay. have started. We actually took possession of the new space, but we should be in there effectively April first. Okay. And your Pride Fest events um, are any of them going to be in person or all virtual again? Yeah, our new. St I, I, you know, I think um, it. We watch it daily, right, to see uh, what the climate is, um, because originally, to be honest with you, we're we're holding a virtual St. Patrick's Day parade. We were looking to do something possibly at Snug Harbor, but the numbers just uh, didn't allow for that. So um, our strategy going forward, quite frankly, with all events and programming are to 
to incorporate in person as well as virtual. Because I think, um, you know, we've, we've always known there are people who are isolated and haven't been able to come to events and programming either because uh, whoever they live with isn't aware or for whatever reason. So incorporating the virtual aspect, I think we'll just open it up to a broader audience. Okay, does anybody else have any questions for Carol? No, I want to welcome her to the neighborhood. I can see her in the office from my office window. <laughs> You'll see our rainbow flag flying shortly. That's wonderful. Okay, um, and I just want to um, acknowledge Jordan from the Bloomfield Conservancy. She was just um, observing today. She's not going to make a presentation. Jordan, did you have anything you wanted to say or... No, I just want to thank you for allowing, allowing me to join this call and observe. And um, it's great seeing everyone. And um, we'll get through this together. Thank you. Okay. And I just want to let everybody know, um, I know all of the groups here, we normally give expense grants. Um, because of COVID, things are working a little differently now. Um, I, you haven't been contacted by me because we don't quite have permission to spend yet. Uh, they're, they're doing things a little differently. I promise as soon as I have, uh, permission, I will reach out to you. If you all want to start gathering your paperwork in anticipation for that, because I know last year, uh, we got word and it was like, boom, 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 boom. Uh, we, I need this now. So if you want to start putting some paperwork together now, that would be great. And, then as soon as we get word from the comptroller's office, uh, we will reach out. Um, and unless anybody has any other questions or statements, uh, we're going to adjourn the meeting until uh, this evening. I just wanted to add that we will, we didn't have our fundraiser last year because of the pandemic, because we usually have it in March. This year, uh, we're gonna hold it virtually and it's not gonna be in March because we're in the month already, but we're gonna have it in May or June. Um, and I would love if one of the councilmen can speak at um, our fundraiser uh, to promote, uh, you know, more more people to donate to the agency. So I just wanted to put that out there too. I'll send the email to uh, Marie uh, of the date to share with you all. Okay, council members, if you could take that back to your principals. Um, Okay, for the board members, can I entertain a motion to adjourn until this evening? Motion to Jerry adjourn until second, 4 o'clock. Four o'clock, yes. Okay, Jerry first, Joe second. All right, thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. We will see you all. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Yeah, notice was helpful, too. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.